There you go, sir. Uh, you mentioned there's a team that's needed locally. Is is that overhead paid for? Is it self self sustained through the program, or would we would we have to advocate to the uh, to the voters to fund the overhead to launch the program? Uh, well, I mean, that's a good question. Generally, no, we haven't seen anybody have to go to the voters to pay overhead. The idea here is not to get hire a whole a bunch of a bunch of folks, but to have the right folks who already work on these things and in a, in a, in a, you know, so make sure they're all talking. So we found, for example, at the city, you know, in San Francisco, we have some folks. We have a city attorney representative, we have a finance department representative, we have a program representative in the mayor's office. Uh, sort of at a minimum, all kind of come, you know, who are there when you have to have a meeting and kind of walk through big stuff. And you mostly deal with stuff individually, but. You want to make sure you have those because you don't want any surprises down the line where you get ready to go to council or, or board or something and the city attorney goes, well, wait a minute, I haven't seen that, or the finance director does. And so I think that's one of the things you want to do. You Also, it's good to have some stakeholder engagement. I mean, we just got done with meeting stakeholder engagement around 200 contractors in San Francisco. Uh, and got a lot, I mean, you know, it's a lot of work, but it's great feedback, right? I mean, you learn really how to, you know, they are the ones who are going to have to go do, sell the program. So let's make sure they know how to do it. Let me jump in here because... I think some of these questions could be answered and then we can widen up. But to answer your question, I think a little, it might have been a little, the program does build in fees normally to help cover its costs. Mm -hmm. I think that was the way. Oh, I should say, I mean, it does. So the basic ongoing cost of running a program, you can build the fees in. I guess what I would, you know, so that is true. I was saying that you shouldn't necessarily hire six people into the city. That, that my point was not, you know, running out there. Um, and very few cities are hiring these days as everybody knows. <laughs> Do you want the lights back now? Uh, yeah. Uh, doesn't matter. I'm going to sit down. Hope you don't mind. Uh, I'm going to be fairly brief. Um, I think it's important, though, particularly in Champaign, to talk about Blaylock Robert Van. Um, we are an investment banking firm headquartered out of Oakland, California. We have seven offices across the country nationally. Um, it is a minority-owned investment banking firm. It is uh, the third largest minority in terms of capital, uh, third largest African-American-owned investment banking firm in the country. And I can tell you, while you know, in some areas that's not a big deal, it is a big deal nationally because as it relates to bringing capital to both uh, institutions and what I would call middle sector and smaller uh, regions, because we, as it relates to the Goldman Sachs of the world, we are fairly what we would call a mid-sized firm. We provide a lot of services to communities across the country, both in the underserved areas as well as in the rural and the community, uh, communities like this. And so I think it's important that Champaign, me being local here, I convinced them to let me live in Champaign and work out of Chicago which allows me to tap into a lot of national resources because they are, as I said, New York, California, across the country, and bring these ideas and bring things that are happening right here in Champaign, Illinois, and benefit our community. And I think this is a perfect example of one of those things. Uh, this, is just, this, this is part of my presentation in Chicago. I know you guys know us a little bit. But uh, we have a municipal energy funding program that is geared towards leveraging both local dollars, energy efficiency grant dollars, and the purpose is to help create structures that lower the cost for the, uh, either the municipal government as it relates to doing energy efficiency retrofits on their own buildings, or for, in this case, property owners. And part of that is implementing the contract assessment loan programs, whether it's special service areas here, contract assessment in California, and alternatively, um, some places are even utilizing general obligation debt financing. All that would be very few. I would call that the uber liberal areas of the, of the country, but generally just they, small communities dedicated to environmental change and vote to make these type of changes. And Boulder, by the way, did have an election and voted to approve the program. So uh, that's an example. Um, kind of the history, briefly, SB 583 was a, uh, the first uh, policy passed by the state legislature and signed by the governor. Um, I was working in California, 
came across this concept of what they were doing there. I was working with LA County, in fact, on some models as it related to funding energy efficiency, excuse me, leveraging energy efficiency grants into uh, larger pools for both municipal funded projects and contract assessment. And when I was sitting there going through that, I was like, this is something that Illinois must have. And took that concept, it's about a 14 page bill, brought it to Senator Frerichs, and one of the great advocacies of this type of program is, <coughs> I'm not gonna, we don't want to spend the state's money, we want to reduce the cost for consumers of energy, and we want to help create jobs. And fortunately, he saw that, and took it, and I think it was the last day you were, it might even be past the last day you were able to file a bill, filed a one paragraph, two paragraph bill called SB 583, which really established the policy to have contract assessment financing, case financing in Illinois. It was at that time we had to figure out, okay, we got it passed, it's great, it was August, who are we gonna, how are we gonna make it work? I think I sent it to somebody and they said, uh, okay, where's the rest of the bill? <laughs> and that was the gentleman here, uh, Kurt Froler. And Kurt's a uh, long time buying attorney, recognized throughout the state as one of the top experts in the business. And it was, how lucky was I that he was right here in Champaign, Illinois. And uh, so he said, let me take a look at this. And he went through it and he came back and said, you know, this can work utilizing the special service area. And as he kind of started talking to me about it, I realized that Illinois has a better law than California. And the reason is, is that what he was talking about in each of those cities, 200, in, uh, I don't know if it's 200 in California, but let's call it at least, how many cities in California? I mean, there's 500 cities in California. I mean, but I mean, how many in, in the California first state? Oh, 146. 146 cities. Each of those either cities or counties for each of their programs has to go into superior court and sue themselves and get a superior court validation that the contract assessment law and the lien is superior. That law will, hasn't, I, don't, I don't know the history of it, but it still has not been tested at the Supreme Court. Um, one day it may, and I'm sure it'll stay, it'll be held, upheld, but there does, that does create a little uncertainty. In Illinois, special service area has been, you know, when Kurt said this one has been Supreme Court tested. It was uh, in the Special Service Area District. There was a legislative, uh, legal action initiated it against it, ruled in favor of the superiority of the lien, and upheld by the Illinois Supreme Court. 